Learners is a pioneering think tank promoting the understanding of how we learn by facilitating and strengthening the dialogue between researchers, practitioners and policymakers in order to bring about an evolution in teaching and learning. Our work involves making connections between the world leading UK research in neuroscience and the best classroom practice. Our aim is to ensure that the growing understanding of how the brain works and how it learns translates into improved interventions and educational outcomes. We're here today visiting Gaia Sheriff, Professor of Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience at the Department of Experimental Psychology, Oxford University. Professor Sheriff and her team focus their research on the development of attentional control and those underlying attentional difficulties, from their neural correlates to their outcomes on emerging cognitive abilities. Attention influences how we learn and behave in everyday situations and is particularly relevant in the classroom. Attention differences are a hallmark of early cognitive development and many developmental conditions are characterised by attention differences and difficulties. Professor Sheriff's aim is to understand how these differences matter to learning. Hi, Professor uh, Sharif, Gaia, I believe. Hi, hello, nice to meet you. Um, thank you very much for inviting us here. Um, are you able to give us a little bit of a, a background to, first of all, I suppose, where we are? We are at the Baby Lab, I believe, at the, right. the University of Oxford. That's great, absolutely. We're at the Baby Lab, which is a space within the Department for Experimental Psychology that welcomes families. Um, but it hosts multiple research groups. The Baby Lab really uh, focuses on the early years, zero to uh, three years of age. Um, but then <laughs> multiple other groups, including mine, attention, brain and cognitive development. Um, we focus on following children as they get older and their families. So you um, don't specifically deal with the babies, no, you deal I, with, that's dare right. I say, toddlers. Toddlers, I toddlers yeah, and I preschoolers. And okay. I, I'm, I'm really passionate about mentoring other uh, researchers who are very interested in developing their career. So, particularly in the, in the toddler period, and then working in collaboration with researchers who work with teenagers, for example, Wonderful. is also something I'm very interested in. So, so how did you get to, you, what, what is your story? What's, uh, ah, it's complicated in that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not, I wasn't born in Oxford. Okay. Um, I'm Italian in, in origin. Oh, interesting. Uh, but my father is Somali, hence my complicated surname. <laughs> and yes, very, the Sharif. Sorry, Sharif, Sharif, there you yes. go. Um, but very early on, my parents, both my father and my mother, instilled in me the idea that you know, if I wanted to learn something, even if it might be very difficult, I should try it. And I think that's something that you know, stuck with me, in fact, from, as a scientist, but also as a person. So I visited lots of places, mainly via scholarships, because my parents, neither, neither of my parents really? were very rich. You so I was in scholarships so everywhere. Yeah, Southern Congrats. Africa and then oh, and wow. then Scotland and then eventually London. So and and in that process, initially I thought I was going to become a biologist. Okay. I was very interested in you know how we we work. Uh, human biology, uh, human biology, marine biology, marine biology to begin uh, with, and then so I moved from seals uh, to uh, in fact primates, so non-human primates, and then I was very more and more interested in human biology. Um, and why the brain then? Why did the you brain, set on the brain because, because I was very interested in behavior and understanding how individuals, organisms, interact with their environment. And in fact, how even if environments can be quite shared and common, what we pay attention to shapes what we learn. So then the brain is the, of course, one way of understanding the how is to understand how the brain functions in the context of interactions with the environment. Um, so that hence the attention focus. So the atten mm -hmm. where, did, where did the attention concept come from? Because uh -huh. is it a relatively new uh, no, area of a, research? A, absolutely not. It has a history in philosophy also as well. So many, in fact, many um, centuries now have an interest in how we might shape what we learn by attending and how what we learn then shapes what we then get very excited and attend to. Um, and so it's not new at all, uh, this interest. I was very, very interested in understanding diverse learners. So in Scotland, I was doing my undergraduate uh, degree there. I came across a scientist called Annette Kamloff-Smith, who was okay. at that point based in London. And I was so excited to work with her as a mentor. I wanted her to be my mentor because at that time, she was very interested in understanding how individuals with particular genetic makeups might nonetheless learning different ways. So diversity 
even in the context of genetic, well understood genetic. So you were diseases. correlating, were you correlating sort of attention stuff, cognitive stuff yeah. with genetic stuff? That's right. So okay. we, were, we were studying how attention matters for children who may have a, you know, even really relatively well understood genetic makeup. Uh, and so that's for, for a developmental scientist like me and Annette, at that point, I was very interested in, because it was at the point where very many researchers were interested in, in, in genomics but less in, the, in how variable children who have sometimes very similar shared genetic risk um, present in how well they attend and not so well they attend. So I started off interested in diversity and uh, in the direction of difficulties in attention. But that, by that and by studying and working with those children, I understood that actually I wanted to understand attention as a whole, variation in attention across learners. So, so how does yeah. how does attention uh, does it vary? I mean, oh yes, I attend and I attend. Yeah, absolutely. Is there are, there are variations oh, in very my attention. Oh, very interesting. So in fact, oh, wow. a very influential book by you know, maybe now fifty wait, uh, forty years old okay. book is entitled Varieties of Attention. And exactly to example, to, you know, to uh, that pinpoint that issue, that there are many different ways in which we attend over time, over space, and then even to internally held to something we know in memory. <laughs> so the objects that are not in, in view, but that we actually have in, in represented in, in ourselves. So those different types of attention play interestingly complementary roles when we learn. You have to at least alert yourself and sustain attention over a period of time in, in a classroom, but also in play. If you're playing, you sustain focus. But at the same time, you have to ignore distraction. Um, and that often happens in space, in other, other places or in auditory space. But then you also have to orient your attention internally to the goals that you want to achieve or that someone else has told you you have to achieve at that point. So all of those attentional processes play really interesting roles when we learn, even through self-directed play, but in, in a guided um, environment like classrooms. So I'm really interested in how that works, how those processes so, work. So um, uh, Natasha Kirkham is yes. Natasha Kirkham. She um, was speaking to me uh, relatively recently about noise oh, and, yes. and how one, I suppose, as a student, as a person, you need to, in a sense, learn how to block out mm -hmm. certain noise. Yes. By noise, I sort of take it as noise, obviously auditory noise, yes. but also, I suppose, too much information that's Visual. on walls, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Uh, have you, um, I don't know, any, any comments about how that yeah. um, uh, that affects toddler play, mm -hmm. preschool play? Yes, it's, so that's such an interesting topic. And thank you for mentioning, Natasha. You know, we, we collaborate, we think together about some of these questions. And I think that what's so interesting about the environment is that sometimes noise is distraction, leads to distraction, but sometimes the environment has meaningful information that could guide our attention. Yeah. So working on that trade-off and that balance, um, either for the attentive learner themselves, I mean the child, or, or by a direction from adults is really important. So what we do do in, I mean, we do in the lab, we study attention in really constrained situations where actually we control distraction and noise. But we also really like to go and observe classrooms and particularly preschool and early uh, primary classrooms. And there that interplay is really interesting. So materials on the wall can carry information and, in the, and adults can direct children to that information. In that case, it's not distraction, it's guiding attention for learning. But in other cases, a lot of information and noise can be hard to, to uh, block out and then learn effectively. So managing that balance is a really interesting uh, interplay that often is guided by adults, but also by children themselves. So um, some of the children I know struggle with attending, find it really reassuring to have an area within the classroom where, that they can retreat to, <laughs> to, to help themselves focus. Um, at, po at points during, yeah. the, during the classroom day when actually things get a bit too much, too heavy, too noisy for them to then focus their attention. So it's really interesting. So is there a, is there a, a, a perfect spot of yeah. enrichment, yes. unenrichment? So you don't want too little, too, but you don't want too much. Absolutely. So yes, we very much play with the sweet spot idea. Not, sweet, not play, but really, really try and understand what the sweet spot of attention is. Too little engagement, mm, deprived, non-rich environments. Yeah. Okay. probably it will lead not to such good learning and no, and no interest. Too much catastrophic failure, there's too much information. But the sweet spot is where we would really like all learners to be. Interestingly, that's very different. So it's different between learners and even within a learner, sometimes in the learning day or sometimes as you're learning something new, 
<laughs> the sweet spot might vary. So capturing where, and, and as adults again, how we, we can scaffold, get into the sweet spot is really interesting and, and, and really interesting challenge, which yeah, one we try really to work on. So with preschoolers, for example, we play with one of the, um, one of the projects we're working on at the moment is testing the idea of the sweet spot, adding attentional challenge mm. to learning, not shying away from challenge, so not making things really, really uh, too deprived, easy. too easy deprived of attentional challenge, building in challenge, but in a way that starts from being quite familiar with activities and games, be they number oriented, in this case, play, adding executive uh, attention challenge to number, um, but it could apply to literacy as well. Adding executive challenge to, so that engagement stays high, uh, but not too, too catastrophically high. And then you're studying whether that has an impact on, on efficacy of learning on learning and how, how young children learn about so that i think brings us probably nicely to abcd mm -hmm. ABCD, yes abcd yes so, so do you mind telling us a little bit about abcd yeah. is it something you established or is it yes it is i mean congratulations <laughs> i uh, my, my running joke is that i tend not to learn i tend not to be uh, studying reading so the letters <laughs> abcd there's no alphabet in what we do very much but, uh, attention of course is the key focus was so really that's the a, a brain yep. because we're really interested in mechanism, how the brain supports Absolutely. this in attention and interplay and cognition a b c d cognitive development and the d is very important in that i'm really in, we're all interested as a team in studying learning as it changes over time um, so both you're managing a, a yeah. team of yes i mean the postdocs uh, okay. and and i mentor early career researchers or independent fellows so they have their own research programs um, and research assistants and PhD students. Wow. Um, so yeah, um, it's a really nice job to have actually, that of, of mentoring people to their career. And the purpose of ABCD obviously is to understand learn a little bit more, understand a little bit more about attention. Attention and, and, and in, in its role in the context of learning. And that work, that means working in the lab to understand mechanisms, but then taking the lab out of the lab. So that's one of the things that we, I'm really passionate about is to also learn from teachers and, and learn by observing observing them and learn from children in their classroom about how they learn and how they attend. So we do about half of our work is in the lab and you saw the pirates. The pirates, yeah, <laughs> the pirates, very, yeah very good. Um, but treasure then chests. <laughs> treasure chests and so on. And then half of what we do is in preschools and primary schools, either locally or further away. Some, some of the work involves working with colleagues in the global south to look at more diverse environments. Um, but the key focus is understanding attention and learning and how they work together. So uh, the purpose of, uh, we, we represent learners here, yeah. so the purpose of learners is to mm -hmm. uh, act as a bridge, I suppose, between the practitioners yes. and you guys, the researchers, yes. and you are obviously, you've bought into it completely. Very much so. In fact, um, well, one of the projects I'm most excited about at the moment is one that was very much motivated by our conversations with early years practitioners. Yeah, really? So this was in, in preschools where educators told us that they were observing and assessed the children <laughs> in their early numeracy and executive functions aspects of attention. And they, and, they, and they remarked on how some of our assessments actually felt like, well, different ways in which they could teach guide attention, which is very interesting. And in that conversation, they told us they would love to know more about both skills in early numeracy they knew less about and how to foster attention within those within those contexts. So the, that was three or four years ago. And that that conversation initiated a project that, that now is developing professional development for early years practitioners. Um, and that brings together attention and numeracy in the classroom, giving, giving educators a chance to know what they already know about attention and numeracy, but also thinking through other things they maybe know less about, and this idea of the sweet spot. So we, we know practically how might that work. And we, and we foster that uh, discussion with educators by suggesting activities, play activity ideas that they can then practice in the classroom, in their classrooms. And we're at the stage where we are assessing whether that is, in fact, benefiting young children's numeracy and executive functions. So can you, can you train a three-year-old to attend more? Well, I mean, or is yeah, there interesting, such interesting. So there is a lot of diversity and um, the, the really interesting scientific literature so far, I think the consensus is that you, if you train attention in isolation, that does not, that's great. You can't, it's doable, it's okay. doable. You cannot train, train attention and work in memory in isolation. But for that improvement to transfer, to have an impact on 
target other skills that are, in fact, quite closely allied to attention and working memory, like numeracy, mathematics, and science. Actually, the two need to be trained, so worked on together. That that's the best recipe for success, is to bring uh, attention skills that matter to numeracy together with good mathematical content, for example, to foster the growth of both. And so I'm, uh, this is very interesting, very interesting scientifically, because a lot of the efforts had focused initially on a strain attention, practice yeah, attention yeah, as yeah, if yeah. it was a muscle yeah, <laughs> yeah, on its own. Um, on its own. Mm. And yet I think the analogy is probably that if, rather than doing that, what we're trying to do as educators and scientists is train a dancer. So actually the coordination right. of systems rather than the muscles that implement um, or the, that give strength. And so we're moving towards the dance analogy away from the muscle uh, weightlifting analogy in training of attention and, and so have you, interesting. Have you noticed um, uh, some sort of difference, I suppose, between um, a, 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 an able student mm -hmm. and their ability to attend and ignore mm -hmm the enriched environment yeah. around them and mm -hmm. stay focused. Yes, so in fact, that's much what we what we used to and we continue to do is to look at indif differences between learners uh, in, t in their attention. And there are some really interesting and early measurable differences even between learners, but they are not fixed in yeah. that. So that's a, that's what we've learned over time. They are, they change anyway. So those individual differences are not fixed and change over time, mm, but they, they tend to be quite robust without that element of supporting and fostering. They are malleable to change. So that's really interesting as well. For individual learners, you can improve um, and, and improve in ways that, that are helpful for learning. Um, so, yeah, individual differences definitely we see. So there are some really, in, even in preschool, we observe differences between children, mm -hmm. children who have um, focus uh, for prolonged periods of time on particular things or on everything. So that's also really interesting. There are some, ch there are some children who don't focus on everything for a very long period of time, but there are some uh, topics and or materials that really capture their yeah. attention and then continue to develop their expertise in those areas. That's also interesting. It's not just attention in general, but attention to what yeah. is also varied across young learners. Um, and in the preschool environment, that's less constrained by curricula and so on. So it's also really interesting to see how that varies. It becomes a little bit more constrained as you progress into primary, but even in reception and year one, it tends to be pretty free flow, mm. relatively mm. free flow still. So that's a really interesting period for, for us as a team. So are any of the studies longitudinal? Long yes, or are you, they are. You're taking them all the way through yes. to? Yeah, yeah. Well, for, so mm, the, the colleagues I mentor um, who have now moved, for example, Carla Hombo, you may meet her, I suggested you do, okay. uh, who was here at, at Oxford, is very interested in babies and toddlers, so yeah. 10 months all the way to three years of age. Uh, Alex Hendry, who is also based in, in the department now, is very interested in toddlers who are neurodivergent. So in fact, uh, maybe, either ha already have a diagnosis of autism or um, have a family connection to autism or ADHD, and she follows them longitudinally, as well as supporting their parents. Uh, think of ways of fostering their attention. Um, I, I, have, I started off l looking at longitudinal, observing changes in attention over time, both in neurotypically developing children and neurodivergent children. And now I'm, it's, this is my foray into working with educators to see if we can identify ways in which we can change attention. Uh, so rather training or training is one way of thinking about it. Bring, brings mm -hmm. me nicely into, um, I, I've been reading a book by Stanislas Dern, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and he's talking about how to learn. Yes. Uh, and one of his observations, I think, hopefully I've interpreted it correctly, is mm -hmm. teachers need to attend more to them attending to. Absolutely. Sounds a little bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? But teachers need to attend more to yes. the attention that the students are or aren't you know, engaged in, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. And, you know, as usual, as a scientist, I'd like to see even more evidence of that, but mm -hmm. I can absolutely see the intuitive appeal of that idea because working with educators, and it, it seems to be something that they also enjoy. So part of the professional development that we're developing at the moment in the context of early years, numeracy and attention, focuses on the adults' metacognition. Yeah, so yeah, you know, yeah. as educators, yes, how aware are we yes. of uh, our own attention to a learner? 
and well, where they that are. There's also point that you made about mm -hmm. uh, whether or not somebody finds it interesting, that active yes. engagement yes. stuff. Almost like if it's too easy, they're mm -hmm. not going to attend. Yeah. If it's too difficult, they're going to give up. So you've got to find, again, this, yeah. yes. this interesting sweet spot. Which in is not engagement. absolutely not easy, especially yeah. in complex environments where there are many children who are working together. And that, you know, that's no, by no means a simple, by no means yeah, a simple yeah, challenge. Yeah. But to be even uh, sensitive to the idea is a really good starting point, right? So that, uh, that as an adult in that classroom, that they, there are really interesting times and spaces to foster the sweet spot, work on the sweet spot. In the preschool environment, that sometimes it, you have small groups of key children or activities or working in the moment. It's very interesting. I've, I've never, I've, I've, I've not, en I've never enjoyed as much actually observing what goes on in preschool classrooms. Yeah. When you see, when you follow, I mean, it's, colleagues are so great because they let us go in <laughs> to observe. But um, well, yeah. I suppose the your ambitions for the place really, yes. mm -hmm. um, and what direction you'd like uh, the ABC. It's, it's ABC not a lab, is it? It's, the, it's a team. It's a team. It's a, yeah, we we call ourselves. Uh, A, B, C, D, and friends. Oh, <laughs> because, lovely, lovely. <laughs> I mean, in the sense Where's that... Where's the E? You need to get core. an E in there as well. Yeah, we need to put it in. Um, and, and, I don't know, it's not... Enthusiasm. Mystery, enthusiasm, maybe. Um, in that, we're an, an extended team. We continue to meet and, and colleagues who stay on, you know, either, either come for seminars or, or interactions. What, are, what what's the um, aspiration of the team is, was to continue to study diversity in attention. So, right. um some of that work has led us to work, as I was saying earlier, with uh, colleagues in the Global South to look at diverse environments, but diverse environments also in the UK. Um, and so we're extending beyond Oxfordshire, <laughs> as, you, as you can imagine, very important. Um, do, you, do you mind mentioning the Global South? Where, where oh, are yeah, else in the yes. Global South? So, I mean, in, in, uh, incidentally, my early life had brought me to Southern Africa on right. all these scholarships when I applied to everything okay. possible. Um, South Africa, Botswana? Uh, no, uh, Swaziland, now Swaziland. called Eswatini. Yeah, Eswatini. Um, it was, you know, the, the independent country and it's really small at the border between South Africa and yes, Mozambique. Um, and there I was really, I mean, I was just studying international baccalaureate, um, but just. also doing community service. So, oh, um, and which was, again, very interesting when working in a ho local hospital with children. So that, in a way that started, even though I thought I was going to be a marine biologist, I'd already had that seed planted. And that diversity of learning experiences and opportunities is really exciting. A lot of that work um, with colleagues have been has been in uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town. Again, incidentally, I mm -hmm. like to work with what happens, and sometimes, you know, uh, life brings you to interesting places you'd visited before, um, and been seeing them again. And and that work has been really inspiring from the point of view of understanding diversity, not necessarily as a deficit or mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. as a deficit, mm -hmm. but rather the um, supportive and or alternative ways in which adults, in, even in challenging situations, support young children is, is something that you learn more from if you study not only restricts certain types of environments, but other environments as well. So that collaboration you're Global hoping side. to continue in uh, yes. Eswatini? In, 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 in Swaziland, I mean, I, it, that in, in, in the Global South and so Southern Africa in particular, what I aspire to is supporting researchers who are there develop their expertise. Yeah. So I'm um, part of a network that's training new researchers who, you know, PhD students, MSc students who are interested in developmental cognitive neuroscience and learning, but are based in Kenya, South Africa, Malawi, Zambia, um, a network of uh, Southern African you countries. You have an interesting Very 20, interesting. 30, 40, 50 years ahead yep, of you. That's Crikey. fine. I mean, so no, not for me, it's on. for others, really. For and, you you know, and it's, others. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's support, to support others. Um, and I, I believe quite passionately it's really important to develop the expertise and, and the and the interests of researchers in the countries that 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 that, that, are, you know, that you're studying. That, so, so rather than me leading the work, I support people there. But I'm learning a lot via via that work. That's what I was uh, pointing to. I'm, I've I've learned a lot about diverse environments by working with researchers who work in different environments. So. That's brilliant. So that's my aspiration is to continue that, but then apply some of what we learn to the UK. Perfect, uh, perfect, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting us in. Uh, it's been absolutely seriously fascinating <laughs> talking to you. Again, about. It was very nice. Thank really you. interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Rosie, yeah. lovely yeah. to meet you. Um, are you able to tell me a little bit about um, your, your background? You're a neuroscientist or? Well, a developmental researcher. So oh. I'm, I'm really interested in the interface between education and developmental psychology. So 
Well, my background has been a bit mixed, so I did my undergrad degree in um, psychology, then I went on to do um, a, po a master's degree in um, developmental linguistics, so I was a, a little bit on the linguistic side, but then I went off and spent a few years teaching English and particularly working with really young children, like three and four-year-old children. What, what is so, developmental linguistics? Oh, so... Um, Sounds fascinating. Yeah, so it's, um, it's just uh, the science of how children develop, how children learn, so it's... There's lots of different areas involved in developmental linguistics. I'm particularly interested in how children develop during those nursery school years, so three and four year old children, and the importance of that nursery school environment and the adults that support them. And what was your journey to Oxford? Were you at Oxford or no, a yeah. circuitous so, route around to get here? Yeah, so I was actually um, I was actually living in Belgium before, but then I moved oh, wow. over to Oxford um, because I um, started working on this position that I'm currently working on. Um, in the development of an intervention for um, nursery school practitioners, the staff at nursery school to work on with the children, which aims to develop children's early maths and executive function skills. So, so, so tell us a little bit more. So you're now part of the team at ABCD. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, and you're involved in the, is it the EEF funded one project? Yes, so the current stage of the project that we're working on now, we've, we've received funding from the EEF, the Education Endowment Foundation, to um, develop this programme on a bigger scale. Um, in the past couple of years, we we first developed the programme on a much smaller scale. So this was funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Um, so it was basically we, tr we wanted to find out how this intervention works on a small scale and now we've been granted funding by the EEF to go into a much, to, uh, um, on a much larger scale. So, so wind back, the, the, the project is called ONE. Is there, is there a reason why it's called ONE? So what the ONE, one stands old. for um, Orchestrating Numeracy and the Executive, which sounds very oh, wow. strange. <laughs> but the idea of the programme is that um, there are these skills that, um, when, that are called executive functions. They are these skills that... Um, these thinking skills that children use to control and direct their behaviour, well, adults as well. Risk use these skills. and inhibition and... Yeah, so it's, it's remembering information over a short period of time, um, avoiding distractions, staying focused on a task. So all of these skills are really important for maths, as you might imagine. Um, and this uh, intervention programme is designed to try to encourage educators to challenge children's executive function skills in the context of maths in the hope to just bring those children, bring all children onto a level playing field when they start reception, when they start primary school. Um, so we've designed kind of these fun activities. Uh, we worked with a wonderful team of um, educators across nursery schools in the Oxfordshire area. Uh, to develop these activities. They're all designed to be kind of fun and play-based activities. And what age are you working with? You're working with obviously preschool, so we're preschool. talking six months y younger? Or yeah, older? no, we um, our activities are particularly designed for three, three to four-year-old children, okay. so in that year before they start, um, before they go up to school. However, we've been into lots of nursery schools and one of the, the lessons that we learned was that in nursery schools, often children are very mixed. They have all of the children in together at some nursery schools, so we've added lots of adjustments to our activities to make sure that they won't exclude the younger children. They might be a little bit challenging for some of the younger children because they often, they're, they're designed to help children develop these math skills, things like learning to count and recognizing shapes. And some of these skills are a little bit advanced for two year olds, but we want to make sure that everyone can be involved in the activity. So is this like a scheme of work almost, or is it something that um, um, teachers educators are going to follow step by step or so can you dip in and out? Or? It's very, we, one of our main aims was we didn't want to make it scripted at all. So nursery school educators have so much on their plate already. Yeah. The workforce is really overstretched and really overburdened. So we really didn't want to make it something scripted, something that put a lot of pressure on them. So what we've done is we've designed this set of activities. I've got one of the activity cards here. So okay. they're just simple activity cards that the um, the nursery school practitioners can use just to follow these basic steps and they're all designed to take about five minutes, five to ten minutes. Um, and they've got ideas for language to use and they're all um, designed just to use those resources that practitioners have in the classroom already. So how does that relate to um, the ABC? I presume it's the attention bit. Yes, exactly. So attention really comes under that bracket of um, executive functions. So executive functions are these skills like paying attention, staying focused on a task, remembering instructions. So we've tried to design activities that encourage 
children to use these skills. So we ask practitioners to really challenge children to stay focused on tasks. And sometimes it's very tempting to remove that challenge, but we've, um, our theory is that children learn best when they have those challenges and that will really prepare them for when they have to sit down and stay focused and pay attention in a classroom when they're a little bit older. So uh, uh, adjusting, can you adjust the challenge? I pr presume you can, you can go from a, an easy challenge to a more difficult challenge. Yes, exactly. And you encourage yeah. the, the young people, the toddlers, to yeah. make that decision as groups or individuals? Or? Well, it will, be, it will be down to the practitioner, the, the adult who's working with the children to try to set the challenge at the right level. We always, in all our activity cards, we have um, a suggested level of challenge to start with. We also have, we'll always have differentiation options for if they find that the children may be, maybe children with special needs, slightly younger children, or children that just aren't as capable, um, ways of kind of bringing the challenge level down. But we really try to encourage them to keep pushing that challenge up. So if they start at a lower level, they want to work up to the original level of challenge. And if they start at the, um, the level of challenge that we suggest, we always have suggestions for how they can add extra challenge and keep kind of developing the skills uh, that these children are developing at this age. Interesting, interesting. Um, and outside of Oxfordshire, I'm assuming at some point you want to expand this a little bit yes. further. Is that is that the plan? So the that's our, our big challenge at the moment is trying to get lots and lots of um, preschool settings, early year settings on board. So we are working with um, in a number of different areas. Oxfordshire actually isn't one of them. Um, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> the EEF has chosen the areas that we can work with. Okay. So we're working with some areas of London. We're in collaboration with the University of Sheffield. We have some um, some settings around uh, Yorkshire um, and some in kind of East Midlands and East of England. But our challenge at the moment is to find 150 nursery schools that are interested in taking part in the programme. Um, and we're particularly interested in trying to target those children from lower income backgrounds. Yeah. Um, when we, in the smaller scale version of the trial, we found that uh, children improved in their maths and executive function skills. Uh, the children who attended nursery schools with where the program was being run showed improved development in their maths and executive function skills over that year before reception. But this effect was much stronger for those children from lower income backgrounds. So that's a real target of ours is to really reach out to those children, those nursery schools in lower income areas. So for anyone watching, they might want to get yes, in touch exactly. with you if they are <laughs> practitioners of nursery exactly. and preschool. Yeah, yeah. so we're, well, we have to finish all our recruitment by July 20th of this year, so July oh, really? 2023, oh, okay. so it might be a little late. Yeah, but <laughs> Anyway, yeah. well, good luck. Thank you yeah, very much for you. giving up the time to talk about it. And uh, yes, wish you all the best with the One Project. Yeah, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks. Hi, lovely to meet you. It's Sylvia. Yes, lovely to meet you too. And you've uh, invited us here to the ABCD lab. Yes, yes, and I'm really grateful that we're collaborating with Learnus and um, really having a way to um, reach educators and parents and the general public. Um, research should not just be in the lab and should not just be in research journals, but it's for everybody. When, how did you become interested in cognition? Neuroscience? <gasps> are you neuroscience or are you um, uh, cognitive science? Psychologist or depends who you ask. Okay, I'm asking <laughs> I would you. say a cognitive. I would say a cognitive neuroscientist oh, because wow. um, I'm very interested in um, the brain, the body, and behavior. So, for example, I um, I study heart rate variability to um, as one of the indices of regulation because your physiological body does interact with your brain mm. and vice versa, your brain interacts with your body. And these are factors that influences how and if you can use goal-directed behavior. Um, and then the way the way you think is your cognition um, and then your behavior is the output. And this um, grew up, this fascination interest yes. grew up in California? Um, well... So you're from California, I, I, I hear. <laughs> Um, so I am originally Egyptian okay. and we moved from Egypt to California um, when I was 10 years old. And I think back to your question of um, why cognition. Yeah. Before, I think before I was even that knowledgeable in the world of psychology, I was really interested in why some children are so much better at learning. Mm and why some children, even if they're better at learning, they might not succeed, whereas others who are not as good at learning or might not perform as highly in school end up succeeding much mm. 
better later on? So these are questions I was really, really eager to answer. Um, and then as I, so I went to Pepperdine for my undergrad. And um, as I started to delve into research little by little, um, I studied different topics and cognition was really the one that struck me as where I can start to understand more about this question. Um, and then I, the more I learned, the more I narrowed my focus a little bit more. And I realized how important math is to the world. Um, we can't really, we can't really do much without knowing math. And it's, it's such a shame that's such a big part of the world. So that's you when you it. became interested in, uh, I think you're special, yeah, you specialize in maths anxiety. Yeah. Okay. And did that drew you to Oxford or had you become interested in that before you came to Oxford? Yeah, so after my undergraduate career, I uh, worked with uh, Dr. Ian Lyons um, at Georgetown University and- In DC? Yeah. Okay. And uh, actually his research is the reason or what really drew me to mathematical cognition. And from there, I learned more and more about math anxiety. And um, we did, we did um, ordinal processing work, um, under learning about numeracy development, the cardinal principle, um, how children really become numerate, um, but then the affective side of it, because humans are so complex, you can't just study how do you learn symbols, which is so important, but there are so many other factors and variables that come in and influence that. And that's where math anxiety comes in. What if you're susceptible to generalized anxiety? Okay, what does that mean for math anxiety? What are your abilities to regulate in the moment to go to your goal-directed behavior? And if that goal-directed behavior in that instance is math, can some regulate better than others in order to fulfill the math, in order to fulfill the requirement of the math? How can you regulate enough to allow your brain to go from using your limbic system more to using your prefrontal cortex more and then use your executive to then address the math? So does, does the brain use uh, similar pathways for maths as it does for language? I mean, we are, in terms of language, you're looking at a symbol, or you're looking at a shape and you're, you know, you're giving it a sound and then yeah. you're putting those shapes together. Yeah. Does it use um, a similar sort of process or so, similar areas? Yeah. I can't speak to areas because okay. I don't study language. Okay. Um, generally, you, your brain is using many areas at once, but what is activated more and what is more strengthened as in what is more quickly activated. Um, so because math is so systematic and is multi-step, um, so at the very, very foundational level, yes, you are learning symbols in a similar way that you would learn the alphabet. But then you learn how to manipulate these symbols. So mm. for example, ordinal properties, you have one and then two and then three and then four. You know that order, it can be just a sequence that you memorize, but then later you learn, okay, one is before two because one is smaller than two mm -hmm. and two ones are two. And understanding that relationship and understanding why two is two away from four or like so on and so forth. That those relationships, that's what ordinal properties is. So and that's those, another uh, spatial step. relationships as well, I presume, I think. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Um yeah. So basically, as you just mentioned, so then there is a spatial aspect of numeracy. Um there are so many mechanisms involved in doing math mm. that then it becomes much more executive function dependent because you're using much more of your prefrontal cortex. I can't speak to language because I don't I should language. have introduced language. No, 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 no. It's just this the, is the, actually, the relationship of symbols. Yeah, and... this is, I've had this question before. Right. Um, and it's a great question and I would like to learn more about it. Um, and people do often ask, how important is the executive to language as, and is it as important as we think about it for math? And I can't answer that because I don't study language, but I can tell you how important the executive is for math. Because for example, without having working memory capacity, how can you hold information in mind and then manipulate it and then bring it out on paper? Um, it doesn't flow as quickly as speaking and grammar would. 
Um, and then again, back to math anxiety. When you're anxious, this working memory capacity is actually taken up. And it's not as simple as, oh, you have high working memory capacity, so then therefore you're going to be good at math. That, it's false. Um, because actually what we're seeing more often is that the anxiety from the math anxiety is more detrimental for the people who have a higher working memory capacity. Well, then what does that mean? Just because you have a good executive, mm. it doesn't actually yeah. mean that you're just going to have good performance. And these are the things we're trying to tease apart. So as a teacher, I see more maths anxiety than I do English anxiety, for want of a better <laughs> term. Is there, can you, can you speak to that or is that? Yeah. Um, why so are we people had, more anxious about maths? Um, why are people more anxious about maths? Is that what you're studying, I suppose? The origins of maths anxiety. And I suppose at some point I should bring yeah. in Atom because. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, <laughs> okay. So a lot. Yeah. There's so much. Yeah. Let's, let's go to the first question. Um, one can be anxious about English and reading. True. Um, and there, we've used in adult studies, um, we've used questionnaires to ask about their reading anxiety and their math anxiety. Um, and they are separable, but they do exist. You're looking at very young people yeah. now, aren't you? You're talking, yes. are we talking three-year-olds? Um, yes. Um, just before that, we mentioned why, uh, why might math anxiety exist. I'd want to answer that because there's such a big cultural aspect as yeah, well. Yeah, okay. So it's some acceptable. of this, yeah, some of the research we're seeing um, examined math anxiety in China, and yeah. math anxiety here in the US and Canada and so on. And like I told you, I'm from Egypt, Egypt. And the way you see cultures deal with math is so different. Yeah. And it goes, it, this comes back into how are educators talking about math in the classroom? How are parents talking about math to their children? Are you suggesting in, let's say, Egypt or China, less anxiety or similar similar levels? Or um, culturally, they talk about math much more? Oh, okay. Different. I would right. say the, the way it might exist, but might be overcome more. Okay. Um, the way it's influencing the performance is different. And um, so, for example, in one instance, you might be told, oh, math is just not for you, and you just stop, you don't try. And in another instance, you might say, yeah, math is a bit more complicated, but you know what? If you practice, if you keep trying, you'll eventually get there. And this is the difference. And um, that's a cultural difference. It, it's, it, seems to be, it seems to be happening more often, but of course, a place like the UK and the US, you do have diversity. So if you, if you study, the localized families, for example. Um, but yes, yes, it is. The emphasis on education, um, I think, is is brought about differently. Um, in Egypt, for example, you could be you could be really, really struggling socioeconomically, um, but education is at the forefront mm. of everything. Mm. Parents income usually is the first to go to education. Mm. Um, whereas in other countries, uh, in Western countries, what I'm observing is that because there are so many other avenues um, outside of education for success, education is not at the forefront mm. and therefore math might not be at the forefront. Mm. But now the world is changing and math is becoming in every single job. So will this change the culture? I don't know. Also, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a sociologist. <laughs> so take us through uh, Atom. Here we are, yes, ABC Atom. D uh, at the lab, the baby lab. And you are involved specifically in Atom, yes. which I think stands for, no, I'm going to try and guess, <laughs> something to maths. Attention, attention I Yeah, attention to maths. So Atom encompasses um, how are children learning um, symbolic numbers. So we have the Arabic symbols, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Um, and you have ordinal properties, so the order of the, num the numerical symbols, and then you have the magnitudes, which is how, what is the quantity of the number? What does two mean? What does three mean? Um, and then there are ways, as you know, of teaching <laughs> each, of teaching the number symbols. And we want to understand um, 
is teaching in the ordinal manner. Um, more appropriate or is it a mixture of um, ordinal and magnitude and we we uh, developed a paradigm where um, you have um, your your the, the children are coming in so it's for um, four six and eight year olds and uh, the children come in um, it's a pirate theme and hence um, the pirate costumes yes hence yes. the pirate costumes they get to build little pirate games and stickers and um, coloring and all of that and it warms them up to what they're getting into next which um, they go into the testing room they wear uh, an EEG net okay. and um, uh, they have heart rate sensors um, and then they play computer games with Perry the pirate um, so can we just sorry, go back a little bit <laughs> yeah EEG e e these are the caps that measure yeah. I'm going to say electrical Electrical, electrical activity, activity yeah, brain waves, right, yeah. yeah. Um, and you're measuring that whilst they're performing certain tasks. Exactly. And you're also measuring the heart rate. Is that to do with anxiety or is exactly. that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So uh, arousal and regulation. Okay. And uh, there is a vast literature on um, when the anxiety comes in. Um, is your prefrontal cortex suppressed? Are you recruiting much, much more so there is less processing efficiency? Um, and then when you're starting to regulate, that is correlated with um, your a better ability for cognition. So then you, you have more processing efficiency, your prefrontal areas are more activated then, um, but that's when you're regulating. So um, your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system come in and play a little game of on and off, <laughs> so to speak. And what are you hoping to achieve with, with this? You're hoping to achieve a, yeah, less fluctuation, I suppose. Um, in, um, in, your in the heart. Sympathetic, in, in your parasympathetic nervous system. Yeah, system. So, so that, yeah, when, when you get anxious, um, your sympathetic nervous system fires mm, really strongly. Mm. Um, the more variation between your, your heart, um, your R peaks, uh, your your heartbeats, mm -hmm. um, the the more variation between the space between each heartbeat, um, the more likely it means your parasympathetic nervous system is coming in and saying, okay, you know what? I'm not being chased by a line. I'm just doing math. It's okay. So let's calm it, calm down. it down. And they, they kind of, yeah, play a gas pedal game for a bit. <laughs> and then um, that variability is what we're measuring. And an increase an increased variability means that um, you're likely to have increased cognitive performance and you're more likely to have the prefrontal recruitment. And are you, in a sense, training the, the prefrontal, the executive function yeah, to so, override yeah, the anxiety, so override the... Not quite. No. Um, so in my PhD work, I measured um, just at the performance level, um, how are children are, first, are the children regulating at this age, at three and a half years old? Um, and just just for the performance, uh, or at the performance level in maths. But in this project, we're measuring during learning, um, because you have the learning aspect of education, and then you have the performance aspect. Um, so right now, we're just purely measure measuring what is happening during learning. And in the... Um, in the game that we have, we have novel symbols that we made up that mean, that have ordinal properties. <laughs> okay. And then we we also have a, a typical Arabic familiar symbols, number symbols, um, uh, part, condition <laughs> that, that we compare. So you're sort of collecting data at the moment with a view to in the second, third year? Third year? How many? Oh, have? for me. What I presume for the, the, yeah, the project. Yeah. So, well, um, so the project itself is for children that are two, four, and six years old. It's um, first cross-sectional, then we're considering longitudinal. But um, but for me personally, I'm actually just finishing my PhD right now. I'm writing up. This is an additional project that um, is a continuation that I'm really excited about. Um, and we have um, other team members working on it as well with us. Um, we have Alex Fraser, um, who's a postdoc in our lab and um, has been a great lead to the project. And so um, also Bethan Grimes, she's also another lead in the project. And um, 
they each one of us has different interests within the really really big learning paradigm um, uh, Alex Fraser is currently developing an AI to um, measure gaze changes on the screen and um, in developing this AI um, the AI is designed to work with remote webcams so that we can access a wider range of populations and um, in developing this, we're comparing it to the Toby eye tracker, not not to do what Toby does, because the Toby eye tracker measures pupillometry, uses infrared. We're just trying to get basic gaze movements on the screen and get it um, to be um, accessible through a webcam. Um, so Alex is and Alex is very very interested in um, attention and oral properties as well. Um, and then Bethan is very also interested in. Um, the uh, the brainwaves aspect, the EEG aspect uh, of the project. So where, where's the future for you then? Your, your future is still in Oxford or back to California? Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good question. I won't um, ask it, just in case. Yeah, yeah. I, I would, for for now, I would like it to be Oxford. Oh, good. Uh, and then we'll see what brings us out in the future. So my students, um, I do a little bit of geography every now and again. Yeah. So my students, they they all struggle with the very large numbers. How do, how do you how do you explain that? How does how does anyone cope with a billion? It's like lots. That's a really good. Don't question. people get to like twenty two and go? Everything else is big, like yeah. loads. Um, yeah. So I I couldn't scientifically answer that, but my speculation. So we, we've we've asked this number and. Can you visualize yeah. a billion things? Can you visualize a billion things? You can things? visualize five things. You can. I can, can visualize vi 20. Sure. Even right? 30 just blends into 40. Yeah. Like, so the idea of a billion, that's... Yeah, geological time, you've got to go four point whatever it is, 4.4 4 billion. Right. I mean, where yeah. do you go with that? Yeah, yeah. Where 450 think... is like 450 million is nothing. Yeah. It's chicken feed. Well, so this is why knowing that ordinal properties, un understanding the ordinality of numbers, that then comes in to say, okay, we don't need to know the magnitude. We don't need to know what's underlying. We know that a billion is more than a hundred or is more than whatever else is underneath, right? That's the ordinal. Um, so maybe that's what allows us to cope with the why, fact why that we can't really can't. Why can't the human can't. brain cope with that? Well, I, pr I presume it can. I mean, quantum physics takes you down to silly small numbers, mm -hmm. and then cosmology takes you up to, I presume, we right, just trying to reason those But is, those that, things, ma is that magnitude processing? Yeah. Is that ordinal processing? Okay, it's a fair point. Fair point. Well presented. <laughs> anyway, lovely, lovely to um, uh, to chat. Um, yeah, and yeah, you. best of luck. Best thank of luck you with so much. Atom. Thanks. <laughs> Vanilla, thank you very much for inviting us in. Thank you so much for coming. And how did you become interested in this wonderful? Yeah, I guess slightly um, unusual background in that I studied economics in Ireland and then mm -hmm. I got very interested in behavioural economics, which is sort of uh, at the inter intersection of psychology and, and economics. Is it, um, was it Kahneman? It's Kahneman? Yes, Kahneman and Tversky. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I did a master's in that in Scotland and then I got a job at um, an organisation called the Behavioural Insights Team, um, sometimes referred to as the Nudge Unit. Um, and they look yeah, at how to yeah. okay. <laughs> they look at how to um, develop and shape policy in a way that goes with the grain of human behavior. Um, and I, when I was there, not just small incremental until you reach a, a sort of yeah, exactly trying to make description, some small sort of... tweaks to everyday behavior. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. British cycling team in the Olympics. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> no. There, there was a book written about it, wasn't there? There's was, there's a book called Nudge. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, glad we'll talk about that as well. I think potentially, it's yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, yeah, Nudge was written by Richard Thaler and Catherine Steen. Richard so. Thaler, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you came, you managed to get to uh, Oxford? So, yeah, when I was at the Behavioural Insights team, I began to specialise in education policy and from their early education policy. And so I decided to do a part time PhD with Gaia here in the lab. Um, and I started that in 2018. So. And what drew you to, because uh, basically we're in the baby lab, so you've gone from dealing with economists, who I'm assuming <laughs> yeah. are mostly adults. Yeah, well, I guess, um, yeah, some of the background literature there looks at uh, the cost effectiveness of intervening early, so the work of James Heckman and others um, in the US, sort of, uh, which 
estimates that your, your return on investment of uh, for every pound put into uh, a child pre five um, really, uh, I guess, the, the lifelong benefits of that are huge. And so um, that's kind of what sparked my interest. Um, but once you get into that area, I was more interested in you know, learning the kind of developmental aspects of it rather than just the cost effectiveness. So Thanks. you're interested in the sort of policy side of things as well as the research side of things? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Applying um, uh, research to real situations, or I suppose the applied side of things. Yeah, yeah. So my research um, involves parents mostly and looking at how we can leverage parents as agents for change um, with very young children. Um, I guess they are the, you know, they're kind of pinnacle in the, pre, in the early years in that um, children spend most time with parents and so we're looking at how we can support parents um, to engage with their children um, and help them developmentally. Um, it's so your PhD, you're, you're currently studying for a PhD. You, you've sort of got a double life, I think, haven't you? Yeah. You're sort of part-time yeah. research, part-time. Part with, with the nudge. Yes, yeah, Group yeah. still. Yeah, exactly. Um, and nudge was, uh, the behavioural insights team was originally set up within government, but we've now spun out and we're um, owned by Nesta, which is a social innovation charity also based in London. So I sort of work across the two now. Um, and I'm really lucky in that my research here with Gaia aligns very well with what I'm doing there. Um, and so uh, one of the key projects in my PhD is um, a large scale randomised controlled trial where we sent text messages to parents three times a week with short, okay. uh, actionable activities to do with their four year olds. Can you give me an um, example? Yeah, so uh, um, the, the way the messages were structured um, is that parents got a, a fact, a tip and a growth message every week. Um, tips included things like as you're unloading the dishwasher, or as you're washing the dishes, count the plates one by one with your child. So they were very much aimed at, um, I guess, sort of embedding developmental activities in everyday things. Um, so there was a, a, a tip. That's a great tip, by the way. And a fact. <laughs> what, what a, fact uh, a fact was sort of introducing the concept of the week. So if it was related to counting, we would say that, OK, this week we're going to focus on counting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just that parents had And what was the final one? The final, one? Um, the final one was a growth text, me text message. We sort of reinforced the concept of that, meet, that week and um, encourage parents to think of other activities by themselves that they could do with their kids at home. And the the, the sample that you're using, is it a sort of random, randomised sample of it's parents a, in a, the local area? Yeah, or? so we ran this trial um, in uh, 2019. Um, we started in November 2019 with 109 schools in the northeast of England. Um, so we had a sample of about three and a half thousand families in that. Wow. Now, unfortunately, it was uh, heavily impacted by COVID. the COVID lockdowns yeah. yeah and we lost we weren't able to collect data for about 70 percent of that sample but we're hoping to run it again um, in the future um, we did it in collaboration with the schools which was really successful and uh, you know amazing work by all the schools to, to help us roll this out um, so yeah we, we recruited the schools and then the parents um, came in that way. And what's the, the other side of, of your life, the Nesta side of your life or the, the, the nudge side of your life? Yeah, so I um, work on education policy for Nesta now. I'm seconded there for uh, about a year from the Behavioural Insights team. Um, and there is a whole mission of about 22 researchers dedicated to um, reducing the attainment gap in the earliest years of life. So before a child gets to school. So um, zero to four or five. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there I focus on uh, mostly policy. So at the minute I'm, I'm very focused on childcare policy. Um, the government recently announced a four billion investment in the early years, which was uh, brilliant. Um, and we're now looking at how that will materialize in the coming years. So um, parents of children nine months plus will have uh, free childcare or subsidized childcare, um, which is amazing. And I think the, the um, effort now needs to go into how we make sure that the quality of that childcare is really high and what needs to happen in the sector to make sure that that materialises. And yet your research is looking at parents interacting with, but we're sort of suggesting that maybe childcare is yeah, I a think more efficient way of doing it. Um, no, I wouldn't say more efficient, definitely not. But um, I guess it's another lever. Um, and uh, I think as well when, you know, there is a really good... Uh, 
connection point there with nurseries if a parent is dropping off a child every day they have that contact so um, nurseries are a great route to to help parents support their their children and with the with the research would the intention be i suppose to uh, almost in a sense upscale it so that every parent of a zero to five year old receives yeah. a fact, a tip and a, and a growth. <laughs> exactly, so idea. we're going through the, the, we're very lucky to have funding from the Education Endowment Foundation for that um, trial. And uh, we're planning to run another large scale RCT with about 200 schools um, next year. And if that's then successful and the, we find effects for um, the, the primary outcome measure will be language. Um, so if we see that it's effective for improving language, then you might do another trial or look at potentially scaling it to every four-year-old, yeah. What's really great about that intervention is that pretty much every school in the country has a texting platform. Yeah, we do. So you could easily um, just give the, the text messages to the schools and let them run it themselves. They cost a little bit. They just, cost about 3p yeah, per, per message, gets, yeah. It's quite expensive. True, email. but I, email, no email, yeah. No. Um, I text think, is more sensible, I suppose. It comes through Exactly, yeah. I think as well, um, it was really, it was a good discipline to get us to write the text messages in a very clear and precise way because you're restricted by the number of characters. So there's no like, hello, thank you. It's just the, <laughs> just the message. And you could, um, you could uh, yes, roll that out into philosophy, a bit of theology, a <laughs> bit of geography. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, no, we haven't gotten there yet, but yeah. <laughs> there's uh, opportunities for you. Yes. <laughs> and so you, your future is research or still um, this sort of yeah so a combination of a combination of hopefully yeah i think it's um i definitely love having one foot in academia i think it keeps you very aware of um upcoming research and the kind of cutting edge of, of what's happening in in psychology um but i also really like the applied side of it and having knowing sort of where the policy is going and what will make a difference um and your, I suppose your take on, on policymakers, do they have a, a, a genuine understanding, certainly in education, a genuine understanding of what neuroscience and educational neuroscience in particular is starting? I think it's definitely getting um, better, um, yeah, for sure. And, you know, there's wonderful organisations out there like the Education Endowment Foundation and, and EIF as well that, you know, are making the case for, for that. I think we have some way to go um, in kind of the widespread dissemination of neuroscience in the classroom but we're certainly moving in that way yeah dissemination to the policy makers as well though i mean yes it, i think teachers are starting to listen quite a lot actually but yeah yeah i'm not convinced that the policy makers at the moment are listening as much as they probably need to yes given there's so yeah. much expertise stroke knowledge stroke you know in a sense we know stuff and it's a shame that yeah yeah i mean I your that... your research is driven by research in absolutely that, the yeah. investment for a zero to five year old is. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think there have been really great examples of scale. I mean, the question, the difficult question in it is how to scale up these interventions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, the Nuffield early language intervention, which you might be aware of is a really good case of where that scale up has happened, but mm -hmm. it's, there was a good decade of research gone into that mm -hmm. before it, it got to that point. And so I think we're moving slowly towards having more of that um, in the classroom. But there are some good examples, yeah. So you're very optimistic about I am, yeah. The future. <laughs> Definitely. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, lovely to meet you. Thank and you. very Good best of luck with the, the PhD. When's it going to need to be finished? Um, hopefully uh, next August. Okay. August 24. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> Thank lovely you. meeting you. You too.